I had I forgot to I had a, a lot of doubts yeah I, and, and you said that it was exactly the reason why I should sign up um, mm, because yeah yeah, we had another phone call and I could I could feel this. You were all up here and trying to think and balance and analyze and get it right. Like, what is the right thing to do? And yeah, and I remember we did a process together online and I got you to relax and come out of your head and a little bit be a little bit more in your heart. And that was when you got the yes, I want to do this and I, I I'm, I'm going to commit. Yeah. And that is interesting. You know, this tendency to be hard on yourself. It did it came through didn't it like the first quarter that we did so this program for those of you who weren't involved we would do um every three months we would sort of repeat the process so we worked in quarters and the first quarter Capucine was the perfect student <laughs> she did everything but she also overdid it and had a yeah exactly had but it was a great lesson for you wasn't it because you could really see within the framework of the program and this is also what meditation is about it's not it's not about sitting on the mat it's about giving you a framework to observe your own thoughts and your own reaction and how that then um unfolds in, into behavior and communication so the framework of the program gave you that clarity and then you sort of took a step back and that was then when phew, you had this huge expansion i remember yeah, I, I guess the, the main issue there, and this is going to be uh, something that is that I'm going to say throughout this entire call, I think it's about toxic perf perfectionism mm -hmm. and why I was using this um, uh, tool to go through my life and and how I, I, I hit the wall at some point. Uh, but yeah, um, I think this is this is what it is going to be about. Yeah. Trying to be too perfect, doing and I literally started the first quarter trying to do every freaking exercise <laughs> because I didn't know that I couldn't do anything else, you know, or anywhere, any, yeah, from an, uh, to another place. Sorry, I'm French. Sometimes my English is not really good, guys. <laughs> perfect. It's perfect. I mean, it's interesting, Th those of you who are on a laptop and have the reactions button, it might be interesting just to have a show of hands yeah. who recognizes toxic perfectionism in their own life or their or their own past, because it's I think it's such a, such an all pervasive thing in modern society that, you know, we will probably find. Yeah, look at all the hands going up in the uh, in the group. <laughs> yeah. So, so many of us recognize this as a pattern in our own lives, um, in our own thinking pattern. And then that awful toxic internal dialogue of I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough. And how that drives us um, to keep needing to prove ourselves. But to whom? I mean, who is the authority over us who says, well, yeah, OK, oh, well, you're nearly there, but not quite. No, I think you need to try a bit harder. It's all our, it's our own process and it's we are our own judge and our own um, uh, jailer. You know, we keep ourselves stuck in that place. Yeah, so sorry, carry on. Yeah. Uh, where do you want me to go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so the, the, the perfectionism was something that, you know, we got, we unpicked it bit by bit and, you know, I would say it's, a lifetime journey of unpicking like we don't get it unpicked and then that's it um but yeah so I mean let's go back to the incident that I mentioned mm -hmm. in the material that I sent out that is possibly why people are here you know you had a free diving instructor mm -hmm. when you were put out you were already an instructor yourself I think at that time so uh no not yet uh okay. so uh, it was 10 years ago I was still working uh in Paris in, in in France um and I knew that somehow I wasn't living the life I was supposed to live I didn't know what I was wanted to do but 
uh, I thought free diving might be a good way out of my life in, in a city. So I went on a sabbatical in Central America and I found myself in a little island um, of uh, Honduras. And there uh, I found a very, very little, very little uh, freediving school. And uh, I thought, hey, uh, I have all the time of my life now. So I'm gonna try to uh, take freediving seriously and maybe becoming a freediving instructor. So I would have uh, a get out of my life. So uh, as always, I'm taking things very seriously. So instead of just giving me some options, it was suddenly my life mission, uh, becoming a freediving instructor. So. Uh, this guy was way over his head. Um, he was just starting his school, so he was still in a scuba diving school, but teaching freediving. And uh, I did a master there. And so back then, uh, he was to me the ultimate uh, authority figure. Mm -hmm. And I've been raised to always respect the authority figure. And even more than that, um, being perfect would bring me uh, the approbation, uh, the agreement, the love of the authority figure. So I gave my all to this guy, except that this guy, like I said, was over his head, but also had very big uh, anger issues. Uh, he was an alcoholic uh, and I mean, yeah, uh, but I pulled I pulled up with abusive behavior uh, because I thought that I didn't have any other choice but to um, to follow whatever he was saying. So it, it, it was very hard, and um, basically he he let me being basically alone with another master. So it was a master. So this is the level under instructor. Uh, and we were basically training alone and he was supposed to give us, you know, uh, teachings, but he wasn't. He was using us as employees, basically, and we paid for the course. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like he almighty instructor. Um, and that day uh, I was with my um, my friend, Helen, and I don't know, guys, if you're freedivers, but when we freedive, we always have to have a safety diver with us. That is, I guess you're all freedivers, yeah? <laughs> uh, and, um, and so I went on my dive and it was pretty much the most amazing dive I've ever done. It was uh, like a 35 meters uh, dive. I did a hang down there. It was next to a wreck, so I could I would have like it was a show basically, uh, and I stayed there. I was feeling very good. I was very aware because I've always been a very conservative diver, always, um, uh, because not being would be uh, breaking the rules, and I've always follow the rules <laughs> so uh then I got back and I was still feeling very good in control of my dive it was I, I I told myself my god I think I got it I think this is this is what I'm supposed to do this is amazing I, I thought like the the world was opening I, I was in it, it was bliss and uh, around 20 meters uh, I realized that my safety diver uh, was not there so I thought huh weird 15 meters, still no safety diver. And I said, well, what's going on? So I looked up and I saw my safety diver, Helen, and next to her on the buoy. So obviously all of this is happening in a few seconds. And so I saw Helen on the, on the blue and next to her was, and was talking to her. And I thought, come on guy, come on. You, you, I just, I'm just doing a freaking 35 meters dive. I've been down there for ages. You don't talk to my safety diver. You just, you know, like, and I thought, hmm, okay, this is very bad. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna take this opportunity to get back at him and all his very abusive comments and all his behavior, like treating me like shit, basically. And I pulled up with all the shit. And I thought, 
oh, oh I'm, this is my time. I'm going to get that mother, um, you know. So <laughs> I went up to the float and the first thing I'm doing is like with this like, like kind of a smirky smile. And I look at him and I say, hey, name. <laughs> hey, name. And he turns to me like this and he say, do you motherfucking recovery breath, you cunt. And it was so violent. He, he, he scared the hell out of me that I froze, basically. And since that moment, that very moment, uh, I thought that I put myself in danger, that he was right all along, and I needed to be treated like this, because obviously I was putting myself in danger. And so this event, from this point on, Every time I felt that I was having an amazing time underwater, every time I was really feeling good, then the next second I was thinking, oh, danger, danger, danger. I associated the best dive of my life with something very dangerous and very scary because I felt shame. Uh, I felt that I was too proud I felt that I was a very bad free divers because obviously uh, I was putting myself in danger and without even realizing it. Um, and, and yeah, and scared basically. So this is a, abusive behavior. And because he was the authority and because I thought I wasn't good enough, I didn't trust myself. I've never been a very confident person. So I believed him. And it's been a very long, long journey to overcome this deep ingrained fear uh, that I have when I'm freediving, not when I'm teaching. When I'm teaching, I, 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 I'm feeling totally uh, legit, but as a freediver, it, it took me years to overcome that. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, this is a very, very extreme uh, example of abusive behavior in the water, but, you know, it can also be much softer of just simply not being acknowledged, not feeling supported, not feeling seen, um, not having the space, because I know that, I mean, I've seen it so many times in the water that it's a space where we open ourselves up to emotions which we might not normally find because when we're busy running around on the surface literally of our daily lives we're so busy and we're so much in our patterns and our habits and water is you know we talk about deep diving going to depth this is exactly um you know what Jungian psychologists talk about is you know depth psychology of going deeper into ourselves and I find it amazing that these psychologists who didn't know what free diving was and they've probably never done it they they recognize that in this intricate network that is the universe life nature um that there are truths within nature which we reflect in ourselves because we are nature we're not separate from nature and this is this is such a big understanding for us and a, and a shift for us to make as human beings is we are not separate. So we can look to nature and we can see truths and we can then apply them to ourselves. So um, when we're free diving, we touch this vulnerable place in ourselves. We open ourselves up. So even if the, the instructor is great, but actually doesn't know how to support you when you have that sort of emotional upwelling or there's some frustration or there's some fear, you know, so many instructors I've seen just, well, just keep doing the depths until you don't feel afraid anymore. It's like, well, yes, maybe that will help, but that could be a very long, long journey. Um, and actually to have an instructor who is with you on the boy and can empathize and understand the internal, mental, emotional, spiritual process that we go through in the water can completely transform our experiences. And then of course you, you went to the absolute polar extreme of having somebody who was 
ab literally abusive, taking out his, his own issues on his students and on his masters. Um, and so in that space, particularly because it was such a beautiful dive, I imagine, I mean, you were so wide open emotionally that those comments very, and that aggression, of course it closed you down. I mean, it, it's, it's, very, it's very understandable. So, um, but what, what I also want to say about him is because what can happen then is that we, we go into um, a victim mentality of he did this to me. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of trauma work um, in, you know, in the modern society, you know, you see a lot of it online. And, you know, we have to heal our traumas. Now, there is also a bit of a mentality around that, that it's going to take a very, very long time and um, to, to heal ourselves, to fix ourselves. And when we say I need to heal myself, there is an implied belief in that, that we are broken. And none of us are broken. We can't be because we are divine spirit. And, um, and if, if we have a moment, um, as Capucine had of trauma, whereby somebody said something to us, and it frightened us, it shocked us, it made us feel diminished and unseen and unloved and not enough, in whatever way, if we um, hold them to blame for that comment and make ourselves a victim to that comment, i.e. I'm never going to be able to move beyond this until that person apologizes or until I've done a whole load of trauma work to get over it, we, can, we will remain stuck. Now, to, to shift the focus just for a short moment is that person and all of you in your lives will have not just one, but several of these people. We often, it could be a teacher, it could be our parents, grandparents, siblings, friends, partners, ex-partners. <laughs> yeah, we all have people in our lives who we sort of say, oh, you know, they shouldn't have said that. They shouldn't have done that. They should have been more loving. They should have been more nourishing. They should have been more attentive. Um, let alone, they shouldn't have been abusive emotionally, mentally, physically, in whatever form. Um, now, those people also are divine spirits. And this is a difficult mental leap to make if you are holding on to anything because of course that person represents fear power um you know they could have done some really awful things but to try to recognize the divine light in all of us means that we can also move into compassion which is true healing because if we can take that free diving instructor and say he is divine light, he is a divine spirit. And his alcoholism and his anger issues and his abusive behavior comes from the fact that he deeply believes he's not enough because of something that happened to him. And when he behaves in that way, he is doing the only thing that he can see in that moment. He can't see, he doesn't have it in him to see an option of, well done, Capucine, great dive, now breathe, or sorry, I was talking to your safety diver on the boy, or whatever it, you know, there are a thousand possible responses that it could have been. In that moment, the only response that he could see from the level of consciousness that he operates on was that. And that's what came out of it. It was, and this is, this is a difficult jump to make, it was innocent. He was acting out of his behavioral patterns that, and he cannot see any different. Brené Brown, some of you I'm sure know Brené Brown and, and I love the work that she does. And she talks about this a lot. And <laughs> she says that often in her seminars, and she does a lot of leadership training now. So she's with, you know, a lot of business and corporate clients. And she said, often she will talk about this. And then she, you know, the hands go up, you know, but what about Trump? You know, you can't say that Trump, um, you know, that we have to forgive him because he's an asshole. Sorry if there's any Trump supporters in here. But, um, you know, he's an asshole. And you cannot say 
that he's innocent or he's doing his best. And she says, yes, absolutely. Trump is doing his best. Putin is doing his best. And this is why we, as the population, need to make better choices when we vote. Because they are doing their best. It's their level of consciousness that they are operating at at that moment. And when we can start to see that and see that all around us, you know, I had, I really hate being moody, but my house is being knocked down and I still haven't found somewhere to live. So I'm a little bit under stress at the moment. And there's a guy who's supervising the roadworks at the end of my driveway and he's parked. So I can't see to get out. I can't see if there's traffic coming. And I asked him very nicely if he would park on the other side of the road. And he said, no. <laughs> now, Normally, my level of consciousness is a little bit higher and I would, you know, try and have a conversation. We did try and have a conversation, but he was absolutely not budging. And I ended up shouting at him and I drove away just going, oh, no, you dropped a few levels there, Sarah. And we do this, you know, we're on this plane of sometimes, you know, we're calm and we're relaxed and we've got good energy flowing through us. And we have the resources and the resilience to hold that calmness and that compassion and that open heart sometimes we don't <laughs> and so we need to forgive ourselves also for that because if we then beat ourselves up oh you were not good enough again on that level you were a bitch you were moody you were aggressive you were whatever you go back into the same pattern that you're actually trying to break so recognizing it and then going into self-forgiveness is the quickest way back into raising your your level of consciousness okay so i just wanted to kind of give a little bit of a you know a backstory of what i see about what capucine experienced and also you know some of the conversations that he she and i have had over the last two and a half years and and what i want to to look at now capucine if, if that's okay with you is why you were susceptible to that comment. Now, of course, somebody shouting in your face at the end of a dive, I think everyone is going to feel a little bit, you know, what the fuck. Um, it could have been a gentler, just not acknowledgement or yeah, 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 whatever, you know, and you still might have taken it personally. So what I want us to do now is to kind of open up the the landscape a little bit, because Capucine in that dive, she was what she was the result of all of her past experiences. And her past experiences created her belief system about who she is, what she's worthy of, and is the deciding factor of whether somebody screaming in your face, you go, fuck. I'm, I'm terrified and I'm going to be terrified now whenever I experience that or, oh dear, you're having a bad day, aren't you? <laughs> and not taking it personally. And so then being able to move forwards from that moment without carrying it. So Capucine, why do you think you were particularly susceptible to that you mentioned it a little bit you know you've always been you know this perfectionism it was already in you mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that sure um so um my mother uh who has always been depressed uh she might even be something uh bigger but she's she has never been di diagnosed i guess uh but yeah let's say she's always been very depressed uh suicidal attempts and all. And uh, when I was a little girl, uh, I could see that my mom wasn't happy. So um, as long as I can remember, I thought, okay, I'm gonna be the perfect little girl. Uh, so my mom at least won't have to worry about me. Uh, and because I saw that being the good girl, and also have two brothers, I'm in the middle. And in comparison to my brothers, that they didn't really give a shit, <laughs> I thought I was being the good girl because I was giving a shit. Uh, and so um, I could also see that from time to time, my mom was happy with me. And I thought, oh, it's working. She, she's happy now. So uh, it feels like over the years, I ended up uh, put her um 
in my own heart and not myself. So two different things. She was owning, so I was never, uh, so yeah, I put her in, in my place, in my own heart. Uh, she was a priority. Uh, she needed to be happy. And so with that came uh, a low esteem of myself and not being very uh, confident because obviously I was too worried about my mom than my own happiness. And I was never, I never had the first place in my own heart. Uh, and so uh, I, I grew up like this, trying to save my mom, basically, which was obviously uh, an illusion because no one can save anybody. Um, we need to save ourselves. But obviously, I didn't know that when I was a little girl. So I tried so hard, failing over and over and over. And that's also why I got to this uh, perfectionism. Because I thought if I'm perfect, if I try whatever I can, I'm going to make my mom happy. Therefore, she's going to love me. Uh, I don't know why and when I did this, this whole mashup thing. But basically, obeying to my mom and being a good girl uh, led me to be a toxic perfectionist. Uh, and so... The authority has always been very important, uh, and I, I've been raised to uh, never being too loud or never being too proud or never brag or, um, yeah, basically the others were always more important. And my father is also a little bit like that. Uh, he dedicated his life and his own happiness. I mean, he, he, got, he stayed married with my mom for 25 years. <laughs> that's commitment that's sacrifice you know when you sacrifice yourself this is noble yeah no it's not I'm disgracing um so yeah uh so when I I got to see to meet this instructor uh also because I had in mind that I needed to find a way out of my life uh so obviously being the instructor and uh, I I believed everything he was saying because I thought that if I'm if he's gonna love me like me, uh, then somehow I was feeling very proud, you know, like to be loved um, because I couldn't love myself, so I was only getting love from other people at that point. And so I think that's also why whatever he was saying, and I, that's also why I pulled up with all the shit, is because I thought, yeah, he's being like a dick, but uh, one, he's probably right. Two, I probably deserve to be treated like this because the end game was to become the greatest uh, um, freediving master he's ever met. Um, so that's why I think I was very um, uh, susceptible to his influence because basically I didn't love myself mm -hmm. and I was getting my, my love uh, from other people by being uh, uh, a good girl. Yeah, putting their needs before your own. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I can resonate with that as well. You know, my mother was um, very ill for quite a large part of her life. And, and I thought, yeah, I can I can help her. I can make her better. I can make life easier. And um, I could really, I, I really could see my energy, my life force energy draining away. She was the one dying, not me. <laughs> but I was kind of going with her in a way, just trying to give her everything that I had. And um, I ended up not even not even knowing that I had needs, let alone what those needs might be. I was really disconnected from, from myself. And yeah, you, you talked about sort of early childhood. And when we look at that, and when we look at, when we look at what is happening to us in the moment, or you know, these patterns that develop in our life that cause us to suffer, and we expand our awareness outwards and we start to look for the patterns and we start to trace back. And when we see that, oh, gosh, it started with that comment when I was a little girl or a little boy, then we can see the innocence. 
you know, we can maybe forgive the little girl or the little boy for believing that they needed to try harder in order to get mommy's attention or daddy's approval um, to feel safe. Because as children, we are, we're all about safety because we're vulnerable and we don't have the skills to take care of ourselves in the real world. So we're very open to creating these beliefs about ourselves and our place in the world and what we need to do in order to get that safety. And we do it completely innocently. When we look at it in our childhood, we can see it and we can understand it. But what happens is because it worked for us when we were little, even though it was dysfunctional, it worked in some way. Even the child having the temper tantrum in the supermarket, he ends up getting his mom's attention, even if that is her attention screaming at him or her. Yeah, I got her attention. Like that need for see me, see me, see me, see me, so that I know I'm safe and I exist. And then that carries on. So for the child with a temper tantrum in the supermarket becomes the angry adult. It's, it's the need to be seen. And of course, in the angry adult, we lose that compassion. We lose that ability to see the innocence that is still present 100% in that behavior, just playing out again and again and again, because we just haven't changed our mindset. We haven't changed. We haven't had an opportunity for a higher level of consciousness to see that, oh, yeah, when I, you know, when I feel frightened, what I do is lash out at people or isolate or run away or eat as much food as I can or binge on Netflix, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and we lose that compassion for ourselves because we don't see the innocence. We, we have that ingrained pattern of I'm not good enough. And, and I think a lot of us don't even realize that there is this internal dialogue driving us. I mean, I remember with students in the water, I would ask people to reflect on what motivates them and to understand the difference, to start to become aware that there is a difference <clears throat> of what motivates us. And this is a key level of awareness of the fact that we are simultaneously divine light and ego. <laughs> And this is kind of the paradox of being human beings, being in this body. It's a blessing. It's an absolute blessing. But we do have this paradox of I am divine light and yet I'm innocent and I struggle and I fuck up. And when we're in the water or when we're doing anything in our life, but it comes through so clearly in the water is, are you motivated by spirit? And that is to say, are you looking for joy, relaxation, contentment, calm, bliss, happiness, playfulness, curiosity, all of those qualities that you might associate with spirit, innocence, yeah? So is that your driver when you go in the water? Is that what you're looking for? So for me, my 104 meter dive, I achieved because after my mum's death, I had a complete burnout and breakdown and I was out for, for a good year and a half. And then I came back and I was like, I know that my joy is in the world, water. And so when I started at the beginning of 2011 to dive again, 20 meters, I'm just going down to touch my joy at the bottom plate and bring a little bit back to the surface. And the next day, bring a little bit more, bring a little bit more. And that, that was my sole focus on every single dive from 20 meters to 104, joy. And that meant that I stayed relaxed. I was not contracted. And that's how the dive unfolded. If, however, you are motivated by ego and need to be better and need to be acknowledged and need to have a number or a record or a title or, you know, I think we all know the very tragic story of Nick Mavoli. And those of you who read his blog on the um, USA, USAA website will see, you know, he said, I know that there is something dark driving me. I'm walking along the pavement and I'm spitting blood, but I cannot walk away. How can I go home and tell my mother that I didn't get a hundred meters and how can I face my father if I'm not the national champion? And in that you see 
the dark motivator, the negative motivator was so present in him. And yet his light shone so brightly. Anyone who had the blessing to meet Nick Mavoli just saw pure spirit. You know, he lived uh, in, in the Bahamas for a while and he renovated the church roof and he was just a pure giver. So his light shone brightly, but he was also driven by this darkness. And so this paradox of human humanity, we could see so clearly in him. He was such a beautiful soul. And so for all of us to look at and, and to, to become aware on a daily basis that we have these two aspects of ourselves, which are simultaneously present and active. And it's our level of consciousness that determines, are we going to allow the ego, the darker side, to be active? and um, in control of our thoughts and our communication and our actions, or are we gonna be more connected to ourselves as spirit? And the, the challenge that we have is to have that awareness moment by moment of which part of us is active. Where are we putting our energy and what are we bringing alive? Um, I'm just looking at the time and actually it feeds quite nicely in because um, in these intimate chats, I want to ask um, my guests to share a practice that has helped them on their path to get to where they are now. And um, Capucine, would you, would you mind sharing something with us? It could be an actual practice. It could just be a tip that you can, you can explain and tell us a little bit more. Sure. Well, it's very simple, and I'm guessing it's only working now because of all the work I've done before and and the burnout I did also last year. Uh, maybe I, I will talk a little bit about that if you do, because it, yeah. it feels like this is explaining how I got to this little thing that I'm doing now that is uh, as like. Uh, uh, a regular thing I'm, I'm doing. Yeah. No, so, do you give us background? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So okay. uh, I, I did, uh, obviously, since I met Sarah, I did uh, a lot of work on myself. We worked on, on it and it, it really impacted uh, a lot of um, um, areas in my life, um, not only the freediving, because actually we weren't really talking about the freediving thing. Uh, it was bigger than that. And mm -hmm. Eventually, after two years, I also do, did uh, hypnosis. Um, I read some books, and eventually, I got to understand uh, uh, the the patterns, and I got to see them, to be aware of them. I still couldn't really do something about it, but I could see them. And sometimes it was working, sometimes uh, not. Um, but uh, I, for two years, I really worked on like. Basically, I didn't have any job because of COVID, so I had nothing better to do than trying to uh, feel better about myself. Uh, so thank you, COVID. Um, and um, so eventually, I got to be very aware of the patterns and my ego and 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 what to do things. So I I understood myself better. And last year, um, like same mm. period of like um, it was February. Uh, I decided to sign up for uh, this French uh, degree that uh, will allow me to teach freediving in, in France. Because for now, uh, despite my two international certifications, so Apnea uh, Total and SSI, I am not allowed to teach freediving in France. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not getting any younger. Maybe it's going to be good to have this option. But I've always looked... Um, uh, hated the idea of this certification because I thought it was very French, very elite thing. And it was like, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about this. This is ridiculous. But anyway, I can't do it without. So uh, against my best judgment, I thought, no, just do it, Capucine, just do it. And also I think in the back of my mind, I thought that if I can manage to do this certification that is quite hard, it's seven months uh, and study and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I thought maybe I will feel uh, legit, you know, maybe, maybe I will feel like, okay, now I'm good for diver because I have this certification. This is like the top, top I can do. 
So I signed up for this and it created so mm. much stress <laughs> because obviously I wanted to do it perfectly and they were prerequisite. I had to have a boat license. I have to be basically first level of fireman <laughs> just to uh, be allowed to say, hi, can I come? Just that, not even the certification itself. It was just the prerequisite. Mm. Anyway, I... I so I use the my usual tools, willpower, disciplines, beating myself up, trying to uh, reach for the sky, like perfection or nothing, and all this pressure. But this time, though, this time around, I couldn't use those tools anymore because it's been two years at that point that I was trying to undo all those patterns. And so I found myself... Uh, under a lot of pressure, but not being able to use my usual tools. So this is when I hit the wall. This is when I did my burnout because I had no, I could, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything that I was supposed to do because I knew that the willpower was not that was toxic, that my perfectionism was toxic. So, but I couldn't help myself. I guess like Nick. You know, I just couldn't help myself. I just went to it, you know, the way I knew, but my tools weren't working anymore. So that's when I hit the wall. Mm. And so I went into like a little depression. And this depression is like the best thing that ever happened to me because I, 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 I didn't have anything to do. I couldn't do anything. And so this, it took me that to understand that maybe instead of using uh, self-loathing, uh, guilt, shame, uh, disciplines, you know, uh, maybe I can be kind to myself. <clears throat> maybe I can be patient. Maybe I can just accept that uh, I can't do it. And maybe I can just think that it's okay. And, uh, very fun fact. So obviously I dropped, I, I didn't even uh, participate to the, the certification, but funny enough, since that moment, since my burnout, my burnout, I've met people, I've done things without even anticipating anything that unfolded everything. So now I'm leaving Thailand tomorrow, I'm going back to France and I'm signed up for the French certification. So I'm doing it again. But this time, uh, I refuse to put pressure on myself. And this is my uh, healthy mantra uh, that I'm trying to, um, um, I'm trying to have this habit now of uh, when I'm feeling that I'm asking myself too much, uh, because it, it is daunting. It, it is scary, the certification. It's still scary, you know? Um, so now I'm just thinking when I feel that I'm get, starting to be overwhelmed by, um, again, this toxic perfect perfectionism. And if I don't do this, I'm shit. You know, I'm just, I'm looking in and I'm hugging the little girl inside. And I'm, I'm just, I visualizing a big hug between me and this little girl. Sometimes there is a teenager me around and I just feel this, this warm, I'm visualizing a warm hug in my heart. And this is kind of a mantra. So it's more a feeling that I'm creating. I'm using yeah, my imagination and just imagining that I'm hugging myself as a little girl and a teenager. And this warmth uh, is uh, starting from my heart it goes all to my body and yeah, it's, it's an, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking, be kind, be kind, be kind. That's it. That, that's my, yeah. But now I'm allowed, I, I can't do that. But a year ago, I yeah. couldn't have this kind of thinking because now I'm just realizing that I'm worth it. And whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, uh, do my best and and it, my best is going to be enough. I'm enough. I deserve everything that is happening to me um, because I've been raised 
with the thinking of that happiness happiness is something that you need to deserve so basically you, if you don't if you're not happy it's because you didn't work enough on it uh so i am i got rid of this thinking i'm just thinking no i'm happy because i'm happy and period <laughs> and and if i'm happy uh i deserve to be happy and and mm. yeah uh, i guess i guess that that's it i I'm starting to love myself. Mm. And this is my tool now. Yeah. Coming from a very long way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I think before I ask you those questions, maybe can you guide us into that visualization just a few minutes that we can all go into that inner hug, be with our inner child, share that inner warmth just you know the voice that you would hear inside of you maybe you can guide us all through that process so that we can maybe have a chance to experience it a little bit i know you've probably never spoken it out loud oh yeah yeah um i, I guess it's also maybe a little bit pers personal maybe people i don't know if people could uh it's okay oh, well, i don't know <laughs> okay share it and we will receive what we need to receive or what yeah. we're so you just share it as as it is for you. Okay. So when I'm doing it, I'm 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 tucking the chin in. Um, I'm closing my eyes, and I'm visualizing first my heart, um, and how how is it? So for me, it's like a big, a red velvet room. So it's very warm and it's very cozy. <laughs> And my little girl is, is usually on the ground and she's playing Play-Dohs or those little things. And when I come to my heart, she turns and she has this super big smile. And I open my arm and she comes right away and we hug. Sometimes the teenager is coming out of nowhere <laughs> and she joins. And then I feel the contact of those little bodies and it's it's pure love it's warm and it's like this little light of love and it's spreading little by little first the entire heart and then little by little it, it grows um um surrounding my whole body and i i really um i really make like a ball of love <laughs> And I feel the warmth and I stay like this, trying to really feel the feeling of this red, loving bowl of love. <laughs> and I stay there for three, four seconds. And then I let go of it and it's like, I'm, I'm letting out this love in the world, basically. It's out of my body. Uh, and and then I just open my eyes and and I feel grounded and loved and and supported. It's like it's like a love of a cushion of love. <laughs> and yeah, and also obviously I'm thinking, be kind, be kind, be kind. I mean, I would invite if anyone wants to share their experience of that short meditation in the chat it will be nice to just see see if people resonate with I mean I could feel tears welling up in my eyes and the vision of the inside of the heart as a room a red velvet room was so unique and it was a real surprise for me when I first heard you say it but then I was like oh yeah totally I love this and I could see little me with a big smile and also teenage teenage me and and but the visceral element that you added also I can feel the little bodies hugging and we're, we're holding each other really it's a really powerful visualization I mean yeah thank you thank you first of all I think I think that was really amazing and to me it speaks it speaks of the wisdom of spirit yeah, because nobody gave you that meditation. You may have had different, you know, different things in books that you've read or gone to different classes or whatever, but you 
actually creating that particular vision in that way with the play-doh and the smile and the hugs and that was that's the wisdom of your spirit coming through knowing what exactly what you need and how to look after you and I remember <clears throat> when my mum died I also had a out of nowhere mantra it just is you know I was in a situation I did not want it I could not change it I was totally out of control and it was terrifying but that and that mantra came through as a as just a little nugget of wisdom from my spirit to guide me through that very very challenging time <clears throat> I'm just looking at the comments here yeah super powerful so yeah I mean we all you know, we are all simultaneously ego and spirit. Where do we put our attention? Are we caught up in the ego? Or can we relax and get into touch with the qualities of spirit and reside there for a while? Because that's where this wisdom, this incredible wisdom, this beautiful wisdom comes through. And, and that's sort of the question that I wanted to ask you. And you kind of touched on it. And I'm not sure that there is a clear, straight answer, because if there were, we would all be Buddha. <laughs> um, and we're not, clearly. But, um, oh, somebody's coming in an hour late. That's okay. <laughs> Don't have a friend. <laughs> um, so the, the, the question that I have so often when I'm coaching people is, but how do I stop myself going down the rabbit hole, hole of the egoic thinking, the negative thinking, the beating myself up, the struggle, the this. It's like we all have a split second of opportunity to just carry on acting out, reacting, or to actually have a moment of consciousness where we recognize that we can connect with our heart, we can relax, we don't have to do what we've always done, because we are now adults, we're strong, we're wise, and we can rely on the wisdom of spirit. So just, I mean, you said, you know, a few years ago, a few months ago, possibly, you wouldn't have been able to get that moment. Do you know <laughs> what enables you to get that moment? Is it a um, thing or a thought or um, I'm I'm guessing so meditation really helped me to uh uh see my thoughts. <laughs> so uh it, it it didn't help me to uh, not follow them all the time, <laughs> but definitely to be um to see them coming and and not to follow them or uh, to be aware of my thoughts and and definitely uh, I I know that some are negative and some are positive and I guess these last years uh, the the negative thoughts I tried to shift into um, something obviously more positive. But the negative thoughts I had is because I wasn't taking the responsibility of whatever was happening to me. Mm. When I understood that I am responsible of, of whatever life is throwing at me, mm. uh, uh, it, it is scary at some point because you think that, oh, so am I crazy? Am I, am I doing like... Am I doing self-harm and, and, you know, but the great thing is if I'm responsible of the bad thing that I'm living, I'm also in control and I can decide to live things in a positive way mm. because I'm the only one in my mind. So I guess this is also what I understood with uh, this instructor is that, uh, you know, it's not a bit of not being a victim anymore. I am responsible and I decide, my ego decides how to live things. Things are things. This is the way it is. But what I can change is how I live through it. That I have a little bit of control. I, I don't like this word, but I don't know which word uh, to use. Yeah, I tend to use empowerment more. Yeah. 
yeah. you're empowered in your own life. Yeah, yeah. And so I think this is what changed is that I wasn't a victim anymore. Mm -hmm. And and also if I am responsible for myself, obviously I'm not responsible for this instructor. Mm -hmm. So somehow it disconnected the the the, the thinking that I stopped taking things personally. I start to focus on how I interpret things mm. and trying to be as positive as possible. And basically all the shit <laughs> that comes my way, I try to see, okay, what is the lesson there? Mm -hmm. And and taking my responsibilities, basically. I, I take responsibility of what, what's happening to me, even sh shitty stuff mm. and if i was susceptible yeah <laughs> to what the instructor said it was because i my ego decided that i wasn't good enough but really? i fed this thinking uh it's all me my mother she always been proud of myself she was saying my my dear daughter you're amazing everything you touch you it's a success so she was empowering me to do stuff but for me this super nice sentence like everything you touch is a success was putting a lot of pressure because i said oh so i i, I can't fail because my mother is going to be disappointed then. So what was at the first at first a super empowering, supportive, loving comment, I, all by myself, <laughs> with all my 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 wounds and you know like my ego, your innocence. It. Your innocence. Yeah, I I took it as shit. Mm. But now I have a lot of pressure on my shoulders because I can't fail. Failure is not an option. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that when I start to see that the guy was not the problem, it, because he, like you said, and I'm very happy that I'm, I'm saying that now because I forgave him because it was his own shit. And at that time, I let myself uh, let him him treating me like this because yeah. I I didn't I I hated myself. I had a very low self esteem, mm -hmm. and so I guess self love and taking responsibility, not be not trying to be a, a victim. Uh, being vulnerable also responsibility vulnerability mm -hmm. like being vulnerable not being perfect is actually good I've never felt so strong since I I stopped protecting myself yeah. because it's just me so whatever happened what can I do it's just me I, I'm not super I don't have superpowers so some somehow letting all my guards down I, I've never felt stronger. So Again, the paradox of being human a human is like when we show our weaknesses is where we find our strength. And it's so true, no matter yeah. what, what you're talking about. So uh, obviously it's not all um rainbows and unicorns, yeah. <laughs> Still a work in progress, but for sure, I I it's been 10 years that I'm having this yeah. mental blockage and it's only been a few months uh, with love and kindness that I managed to overcome this so uh, yeah it's it's an, I guess a never-ending thing <laughs> yeah it's the it's the path that we all walk it's called life and uh, we, ne we are never a finished product we never reach a destination until the journey's over and um you know, it's humbling, but it's also exciting, you know, like you say, even the shit, you know, for me, you know, a bad day in the water was so much more valuable than a good day, because those were the days where I got to go, ah, oh, look, look what happened, look what I thought, or look what I did, and 
and then I know, okay, I had to direct my attention there a little bit and and unpick whatever it was that that happened. It, it's there to show me something. It's not mm-hmm. there to make me go, oh shit, well, and that, you know, I'm I'm not good enough, and this is proof that I'm not good enough. So now I need to beat myself up even more, and I need to think my way into better diving or to figure this out and analyze it to death and blah blah blah. blah. No, it's just like, oh, this is a gift. This is showing me what I need to see right now and I'm grateful and in that gratitude there is openness there is relaxation and there can be curiosity and even playfulness of ha huh, I wonder what's going to happen then tomorrow exactly this is uh, this is exactly what I thought for me it's like almost a game now yeah. when mm-hmm. shit happens I'm thinking okay the universe is testing me all right so <laughs> What is there to learn? Like, what what am I doing? And and maybe I see signs everywhere. You know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, and obviously, uh, you know, like you with with the guy, the 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 worker uh, man, the the, uh, the worker like uh, that um, in your house. Uh, oh my, yeah, the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, sometimes I don't have this energy, and I'm still going into my old patterns of of you know snapping at people and you know like because yeah I'm not Gandhi you know (laughs) (laughs) and even Gandhi probably snapped (laughs) you know it's like he was also human so I I think yeah I think you know a lot of this spiritual teaching and books and movies and that we tend to idolize people and put them on a pedestal and you know what we're all the same we are all the same some people are blessed to get the insights a little bit quicker. Some people, are, they really can't see anything difficult, they're different, and they spend years, and if, if not an entire lifetime, just seeing life through the filter of their ego, creating their own struggles and blaming the world. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, the responsibility is the empowerment. Mm-hmm. Long story short, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's when I stop doing to to um, um, everything I tried to not be, mm-hmm. and I tried so hard not to be. When I let let myself being that, then this is when all opens. So it's like it's it, it's very hard to see because you your ego is is really put the greatest effort to uh, to really um uh, uh, um um oh, god well, my brain just froze <laughs> sorry protect <clears throat> yes but it's not protection in the way it's it just keeps you stuck yeah yes, yes. The yes. Illusion of protection which keeps you stuck it needs yes. to keep you where you are it needs certain yeah. because the very be- behavior i didn't want to uh thought uh, the very be- behavior I thought was terrible and was my doom freed me yeah yeah it's the crisis which is often the awakening and you've had a couple in the last few years from what I see yeah yeah I'm just I'm just saying thank you Capsine. I'm seeing that some people are leaving so goodbye Karen goodbye Sylvia thank you for joining us and I'm just wondering um if there's nothing more that you'd really feel is urgent to share capucine if we maybe open up for some questions from people mm. who, who are with us yeah um just i'm going to start because um deepesh sent me a, a direct message <clears throat> while we were talking um is um so deepesh is a is a yoga teacher and i don't think he's a free diver but i could be wrong um so as in can some as sometimes can happen in deep meditation that uh, a suppressed memory something that we deem to be maybe traumatic comes out can this happen also in the water so i know what my uh my response would be joanna do you want to put your message in the group rather than direct to me so i'm i'm then we can just see them and, and work through them so yeah, Deepesh, Deepesh's question, um, you know, these suppressed memories coming up in the water, um, is that something that you recognize, Capucine? 
with the uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I unfortunately I had this this mental blockage, so uh, I I'm always when I'm going deep, I'm always always self aware, uh, and like like very careful because, like I said, if I feel like I'm feeling too good, uh, so I I'm always uh, yeah it's it, it's been I can't really say because it feels like I've never let myself go to the point that I would allow uh, repressed memories to 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 mm -hmm. come. Ah, okay, okay. I mean, from my experience personally, and also from having coached a lot, a lot, a lot of people over the years, um, yes, yes, Deepesh, there is um, there is a clarity that the water brings. For me, the ocean is. Um, a mirror in which we see ourselves without any um, any of the filters that we choose to look at ourselves through, either making ourselves out to be better than we are or worse than we really are. And, and it actually shows up those illusory um, beliefs that we've built up around ourselves. So, um, for me, the water was a place where I got to know myself truly, because there is an um, a radical honesty that we receive from the ocean. So when, um, I don't know if you know much about free diving physiology, so I'm just gonna do a tiny, a tiny little bit, and those of you who are free divers will, will understand what I'm talking about. But as you go deeper, there is um, compression on the air spaces in the body. And that happens absolutely safely if we are relaxed and if we're ready for it. But if we are in any way in resistance to that, then we will either not be able to go further or we will sustain an injury. And that gives us an opportunity for radical honesty. Now, this is also combined with like Capucine says, she's a very conservative free diver. I was also. So am I trained enough? Is my physiology adapted for this level of compression at these depths? So it could be that no, like in the case of Nick Mavoli, trying to go too far too fast. Um, but for most of us, um, that sensation of discomfort at depth is more likely to come about because we are not in, in acceptance about something within ourselves than lack of training. I and mean, this is for this is for free divers who are conservative and who have put in the time and the effort and their depth progression is really, really sensible, you know, one meter at a time and sort of repeating and, and then continuing. Now, um, so the, the ocean gives us this opportunity for absolute clarity, because if I feel discomfort on a dive, the first thing I ask myself is, what am I thinking? What fears am I bringing alive? What beliefs are holding me back at this moment? What am I resisting? And that's an opportunity for self-reflection that we have in the water because we actually get a physical sensation on the chest and it's very, very clear. We of course also have that opportunity in any moment because the body's way of expressing something is not aligned with the truth of our soul, of our spirit, is going to be an emotion, a contraction, a sensation that is not pleasant somewhere in the body, butterflies a little bit of nausea, feeling tightness in the chest, a higher pulse rate, a little bit sweaty, you know, whatever it is. And that can be, so, so the body is this amazing messenger that is the way that our soul, our spirit communicates to us because it doesn't have a voice, but the body is there as the messenger, as the vehicle and as the messenger. And it enables us when we are in touch with the sensations in the body, when we're awake and alive within our own body, rather than numbing or distracting or running away or 
you know, using anger or whatever else it might be to not feel what we're feeling in that moment. Um, that's an opportunity to have that radical honesty with ourselves and ask the question, and what is going on right now? What is really going on? Not the person in front of me shouting at me or making me feel unloved and unworthy, but what is happening inside of me? And so the ocean is a, I would, for me, it kind of, it's like meditation on speed because it, it enhances so much the physical, the access to that physical sensation and the gateway to that moment of radical honesty is really, for me, much more obvious, much more enhanced in the moment than it is in day-to-day um, -day life. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and Joanna, so I think possibly Joanna, my, that answered your question, how do we link all of these discoveries back to freediving training? <laughs> um, if anyone has a question, you can, you can unmute yourself and um, you know, we can, we can open up a little bit more. Oh, you are into free diving as well, cool. Um, yeah, does anyone have anything? So Joanna, you've got some questions. Why don't you unmute yourself and then we can um, have a bit of a chat. Hi everyone. Hey, do you want to put your camera on as well? Oh, yeah, sure, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, there we go. Hi, I am Joanna, I am actually, I, I grew up in the States and, but now I'm in, uh, in Taiwan and I am a, a freediver instructor and also a <laughs> yoga. So I have been practicing yoga for quite some time. And, but lately, I think this last two years, I have been um, getting into the uh, meditation and all that. Um, and so I, I totally understand what Sarah is talking about and that I think um, that is the reason why I'm actually also very passionate about like how freediving can actually help us to understand our, um, our fear, our emotional problems. And um, I think it's fascinating to, to know that actually someone from the other side of the ocean actually um, have the same thoughts. And that actually gives me a lot of encouragement that I am on the right path. Um, so I have been, um, I think uh, in Taiwan, we have even worse um, emotionally, like they're, they're actually like, it's, it's bad, like the anxiety and the depression that is like um, affecting the Taiwanese are, I think the, the ratio is even worse than in the Americas or like in, the, uh, in, in Europe. Um, the reason why is that because all the Taiwanese were kind of brainwashed when they were kids that ocean is dangerous. So that is one thing. And then the other one is that the, the parents won't like, um, I was born in Hong Kong. So my parents like would like throw me into the water when I was like three years old, but like here they, they don't, they don't the parents won't teach, like won't offer clock, uh, class or even like teaching the kids to how to swim. So, so what happens is that maybe um, I think like, uh, forty percent of my students uh, would not be able to kind of like swim uh, for you know hundred meters nonstop, feeling relaxed, regardless of speed, and so um, and then some of them cannot even know. Some of them actually don't know how to swim. Some of them actually have fear in water, but I think they kind of like uh, as what I kind of like express in on my Insta Instagram account, and then I think. They, they understand what I've been trying to talk about, like how freediving actually reveal um, anxiety and fear and how we can actually use freediving to see ourselves more clearly and actually be able to practice how we should face our internal fear. And so some of the students actually like sign up and then we were having some traction on like getting them not as um, anxious or, uh, we feel more relaxed when after the class and when they are going to the ocean by themselves with their friends. So we, we're seeing results. And that's why I'm so interested in like uh, following Sarah because um, I think she, she's like a great mentor and a, um, a very great teacher on this expert. And um, I think because of your death, um, it's even showing that what we are talking about right now, it will work. 
And so um, I am really excited and actually really be interested to know how we can actually, how I can actually share all that knowledge or like what I have learned to um, the Taiwanese community here. And that's mm -hmm. why I've been like, uh, but then, you know, it's so like, it takes an hour for us to explain all this. And I think there is also like the fact that there are not a lot of people understanding, you know, the inner child, the emotion and the linkage, the connection between body and mind and soul. Like that's a very deep conversation to people who are not doing yoga or meditation regularly or those who don't do free diving a lot. Um, so yeah, so I think my hurdle right now is that how do we explain it in a very easy way that um, free diving and yoga are actually, um, it's not just a sport, it's actually like healing ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's a practice that we should be doing it for life. Yeah. yeah. Capucine, do you want to share something and then I'll pick up? Uh, I, I don't know if it's going to help, but like first thing that came to my mind is that uh, what I've observed on the buoy is that people uh, are really uh, too hard on themselves. And uh, also they expect results right away. And when they don't, uh, they are a bit ashamed that it's not working right away. Uh, so uh, what, I, what I tell to, to people, but I don't have phobic and I, I don't think, I have people that are very uncomfortable, uh, but uh, not to the extent that you, you you, you, you're explaining uh, that it's a trauma like um, but what I tell people is that basically to respect their own rhythm uh, and th this is a very personal practice and they can't compare each other and the they need to respect that and if it means that it's going to take time so be it and there is no shortcut to understanding how the body works because obviously and i'm sure you do we obviously explain all the amazing things that are physically happening to the human body on the water so they have like kind of a guidelines like facts and i'm basically telling them that their body knows the mind doesn't but if they let the body show that everything is okay then the mind will follow, but they need to take the time to do so. Uh, so for me, time is paramount and, and personal rhythm also is, is paramount because the fear is because people are getting stressed and there is an urge to do something. So, so when you, you take off, you take away the time factor on the anxiety, uh, it's it worked on some of my students, but again, uh, it seems that you you have uh, you're talking about traumas, and I, I don't know if it will work. Mm. I mean, my feeling is, um, yeah, what I would what I would share with you is you have to as the instructor, and this goes for whoever is teaching whatever you know, whatever the profile of the group or the individual student is, if you want to introduce spirituality and uh, this deeper level of awareness, opening people up to what is inside of themselves, you need to start where they are. You cannot take somebody who doesn't believe in spirituality and tell them this is about spirituality because they will throw it all out of the window and they will not hear a word that you've got to say. Um, you know, and you know, because of my because of my profile, it's a little bit unique. You know, I have the world record, so I got you know the corporate merchant bankers, the guys with the big egos and the big wallets. Oh, you know, I'm going to go and train with Sarah because she's the best in the world, and and that's good for their ego. You, you want them to do yoga and meditate and talk about their emotions? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, and on the other hand, people know me as, you know, the more spiritual free diver. So I would also get the people who are all, they're totally ready to dive in and go as deep as deep as they possibly can. The, you know, the merchant bankers, to just put them in a little bu bubble together, um, they need to start 
with something that is very cerebral, analytical, and something that they can relate to. And like Capucine just said, the body. The body is the gateway into the, the mind and the spirit. Yes. And if you, I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not here to sell anything, but my yoga for free diving videos, the deep relaxation course, I talk about, th this is kind of the lecture in brief that I would give on the first day, which is think about your body, think about the miracles that occur in your body, you know, and I'll have people going, okay, so what did you have for breakfast? They go, well, you know, I had an orange juice and a coffee and two pieces of toast and, you know, or my protein shake, probably normally a protein shake, actually, for those guys. <laughs> and and I'm sort of saying, OK, so that was like two hours ago. And are you thinking about it? Are you trying to make sure that your stomach uh, breaks it all down properly and that you're releasing the right acids and the right so that you can absorb the proteins and the vitamins and the minerals and blah, blah. is that an intellectual process does the fact that you have this amazing degree and this amazing job and this amazing salary does that make you more efficient at digesting your breakfast than the guy who cleaned your bathroom this morning after you left your hotel no and that's like it's the great leveler you know the body is ultimately wise and it's universally wise and it doesn't matter what qualifications they have their body knows better than their cleverness. They cannot think themselves into a free dive. And that's a really great opener because they, you know, you get them laughing and they're open and they start to get a bit curious. And then you can talk about, start talking a little bit about the physiology, the miracle that is, you know, the human body, the nervous system, the digestive system, the pulmonary system, the respiratory system, the hormonal system, and just get them present in their physical bodies realizing that there's a miracle occurring inside of them every single moment that they are alive but they never take the time to think about it because they are so fascinated with their own intelligence or in your case they will be fascinated by their own fears and that is a huge distraction so to bring them into their body and to get them to just you know breathe and feel the breath and relax and trying to visualize all of these incredible processes that happen while they're digesting their breakfast is just, it's a beautiful way to take them in. So see how that goes. And the video courses might give you some tips and some, some other materials and ideas to work with. Okay, I sounds good. Like, I also feel like if you start to focus on the body, so this is a good distraction, uh, uh, eventually if you, if you say that your body is an amazing uh, machine, then maybe it will encourage them to have uh, more positive thoughts. So uh, if they think my body is great, how can I uh, make it even greater so it will help me to, uh, to go over things? So like from the body to the mind and mind to body, um, because uh, when they are super tense, the body also is very tense. So uh, if they manage to relax the body and, and try to respect it as it is, and this is their own, um, th this is also why I say take the time, um, don't rush, uh, respect your own rhythm, and then it, it gives um, patience in, the, in, their, in their th the way they think then. They say, oh, okay, so I don't need to rush. So then they have more time to relax the mind somehow. Like the body is kind of an excuse, like a, an excuse to, to also ease the mind if, if they know that they can ease the body first. Cool, thank you. Does anyone okay. else have any questions? Thank you, Joanna. It was really um, a nice conversation there, thanks. Does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to bring? Otherwise we'll just wrap up and you can all go off and enjoy what is left of your Saturday and the rest of the day. Somebody's unmuting, or was that you, Mark? That was me. Can I <laughs> yeah. just say? Can I just say? Um, first of all, thank you so much to both of you. But Christina, I, can I just say you've become an absolute credit to yourself, mm. and uh, I think that's the most important thing that you've become. I know you feel it's you're still on a long path, and I kind of I've got a lot going on that isn't nearly as extreme as you've had. 
and that kind of made me feel a little bit that uh, I should get off my arse and do something about it because I haven't got as big a hill to climb. Um, but um, although not magnified as much, a lot of what you've said has resonated and uh, it's been really useful. It's going to take me a little while to go away and comprehend it all. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Just like a couple of things, like all things that Sarah and Tap you mentioned, like it resonated 120%. Coming from an Indian background, living in Sydney, I mean, it's so, I would say, encouraging to see, you know, people talking about spirituality in the Western world, where it's totally the other way around in India now, or the Asian countries, as uh, I think Joan was also mentioning. It's, if it, things have, the paradigm have totally shifted. So when you talk about meditation or mind body body awareness or anything in India or or, or a place like that, um, people won't even get it. But uh, I could resonate with everything. I did a ten days of the Pasana course start of this year, and it was a lot about just going through the sensations of the body and the same thing I feel uh, when I'm doing the free diving. You know that at some point when you are so calm that you know you let your body relax to let those fears or anything. That's been way too pressed on maybe in this lifetime or maybe in other lifetimes, if you believe in different lifetimes, uh, show up and just gives you that calm, comfortable space to just see it and let it come out instead of you suppressing it maybe with your egoistic uh, boost of your career or money or whatsoever. Just to just let it come out. And that's where I was trying to ask that question. That does it ha Did it happen with you as well that you came from a beautiful free diving session? You were so calm and suddenly something came up which was unusually not um, comfortable, but it gives you a very calm and secure space to just let it come out. Yeah, I think you, you just said it yourself, you know, when the body relaxes, there's space for the stuff that we hold on to when we're super contracted, there's space for it to come out because we, we let go. And uh, yeah, so, you know, things come to the surface. <laughs> One thing I see very often is the the abdomen is very tight in free divers because this is sort of really where we're where where we where we are physically most vulnerable. It's the soft part of our body, which doesn't have the protective cage of the ribs and and bone structure around it or the skull. Down here we are super soft and and open, and so in free diving I often see people their belly they don't realize they're doing it but their belly is tight. And you get people to dive and just put a hand on their belly and just let it go soft. I mean, A, it's counterculture because we're all supposed to have <laughs> flat, tight bellies. Um, <clears throat> but when they do it, yeah, there can be there can be emotion. There can be a realization that, you know, they've spent a lot of their life holding on and controlling and um not being able to let go and not being able to feel so there I mean there are so many ways it you know it and it's really an individual thing you you see the person in the water and you see the physiology and you can with experience or with a gift I don't know quite how I found my way to do what I do <clears throat> but I can see I can see as soon as I see somebody in water like what is going on for them internally and help them encourage them you know there's there's no fear there's no shame in like capucine says there's actually strength in showing those vulnerabilities and and making space for them in our lives um and on that note actually i would just like to go back to mark thank you so much for that share it really touched me and i probably touched capucine even more deeply because it's her personal story but thank you for having the courage just to share that with us today and and i really yeah, I'm cheering you on. Whatever, whatever it is that you you want to get on with now, then um, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Um, <clears throat> any last questions? Thank you, also Deepesh. It's nice to see you. We've been in touch for so long, but nice to see you here today. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else? No. Okay. Well, then we were, we're, oh, somebody's giving a thumbs up or that's just a thumbs up rather than a, I want to speak, Joanna. Okay. <laughs> so in that case, um, I'm just going to say a little bit, like if any of you feel touched and would like support, 
Um, obviously, my coaching is one to one is ongoing throughout the year. I'm starting a new group um, journey uh, later in this spring. Um, it was going to be April. I'm not sure right now because I'm having to move house. So I'm going to see how life unfolds. <clears throat> um, but the the, six, the the group journey is a six month program where we will look at also the Ayurvedic wisdom and how to get yourself strong and balanced and rested. Again, most of us are pretty exhausted because we have this toxic perfectionism of more is more. No, <laughs> not always. Um, so and and there's then there's the emotional, the, the DYD side of things, you know, the emotional, spiritual, mental coaching, which helps then to support whatever processes are are then brought out through that. Um, so if anyone would like any, any information, you can drop me an email. One to one starts anytime. Um, and also you can combine one to one with the holistic uh, free diving by using the video courses with supported with coaching. So that's my last little um, just bit of sales pitch there. If anyone feels they need support, then I'm here. Also, Capucine, she's now going back into school, so she won't be available for coaching right now. But um, I will be sharing her Instagram um, and, you know, any ways that you can contact with her. Actually, one thing just to finish off about Capucine is her big passion is the dolphins. So do you want to just talk a little bit about that, Capucine? Because I know this is this is really where your heart is in terms of the ocean. Yeah, this is how I, I discovered freediving. I, I booked for um, a liverboat in the Red Sea, uh, swimming with dolphins of, in the south of Egypt, like Sataya. Maybe some of you already know uh, this uh, this um, site. And, and yeah, like uh, swimming with dolphins, it's uh, they open your eyes uh, and they are so generous and so they're like like the water the water is a mirror but dolphins also so you have like two big mirrors in front of you when you swim with the dolphins and and yeah they taught me uh, a lot of things I, I think I wouldn't be the same it, it started all my journey into uh, self-improvement self-love it's also like everything started, freediving started with the dolphins because they showed me that um, um, I'm exactly good as I am. And, and this is the first time I've seen that. They showed me that I was good enough because they were accept, accepting me in the water and I was super messy and like, I didn't know what to do with my body. And, and, and yeah, they were the first ones that showed me that I was good enough. So, yeah, it helps. So, yeah, mm -hmm. now I'm not uh, a guest anymore. I'm I'm helping uh, my friend who is organizing those trips, um, those liver boats in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. But yeah, those are amazing animals, and they taught me a lot. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so I will share um, information about the the trips that Capucine Co organizes. So if anyone wants to have an experience with her with the dolphins in the Red Sea could be the moment that your life changes too. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we do like, uh, obviously we speak English, uh, the, 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 the crew speak English, but yeah, we do like themes and it's all about also the self-improvement, but those things might be in French. So um, yeah, ah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. French market. Okay, so. Thank you all so much for taking this time to sit with us and share and open your hearts on a Saturday morning. Thank you to Capucine especially for very, very generously sharing her story again with me and now with all of you and her courage to open up her strength <laughs> to, to be vulnerable with us today. And um, I certainly take a whole different energy into the rest of my weekend after this call. So thank you. Be kind. Be kind. Be kind. Yeah. Be kind. Has, I'm just going to share this. Does, the, the British people will know the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse. Um, the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse. And the people are going, what the hell is she talking about now? Um, <laughs> this is, um, it's a... a um, it's not a cartoon book, but it's, yeah, it's an illustrated book by a guy called Charlie Mackesy. 
in England and it was turned into a beautiful animated film at Christmas and it's also an audio book and a pod you can you can listen to it also on Spotify as a podcast and it's beautiful it's it's like all of the truths that we've talked about today <laughs> in one it's like a what the, the audio book the podcast is one hour and it's just lovely and just Capucine's you know be kind um the mole asks the boy what do you want to be when you grow up and the boy's answer is kind so I'm going to finish there. I recommend this to all of you. It's a fabulous listen and it's a heart opener. If ever there was a heart opener, it's this. Um, so enjoy. That's my gift to you of this weekend. The video will be going live early next week. And thank you all. Elmar, great to see you again. And um, thank I remember you. Elmar. I remember Elmar. Remember. So if everyone wants to video on unmute we'll have a, a last little goodbye thank you all so much <clears throat> and i'm here as long as anybody needs me chris great to see you thank you so much for being here um marta deepesh rosie joined us an hour late but it's great to see you thank you mark chris you. julie evgeny george george good to see you a second time without video mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm. Thank you very much for the session today. I'm sorry my video doesn't work. I'm stuck in the backwaters of Wales, and if I put the video on, I lose my connection, and it's just the way it is. Sorry. I'm also <laughs> shy, so it works in my favour. Is um, well, since I saw you in 2014, you really opened up, or well, you threw me down a rabbit hole by okay. asking me why something so simple as why, and it started off um between 30 and 40 meters I isn't sorry before I ramble on is now the right time for a yeah, short go for it. yeah absolutely if people um, want to stay in and listen then you know we'll we'll continue the conversation please yeah go ahead George okay um that you asked me why um why was I slowing down between 30 and 40 meters so looking at the data afterwards mm. and honestly it was I was scared it's all right why so oh I don't know and that led me on a whole, well, it, it continued the journey. I ended up in Norway with sled dogs for a year. Yeah. And the similarities between training a team of sled dogs and training for competitive freediving was uncanny. Mm -hmm. So for me, for freediving, my approach in the end was sitting on the surface of the surface of the water on the noodle breathing up and I'm smiling, I'm giggling, I'm about to go and do what I love to do to so start with a smile. But it wasn't me that was doing the dive. If I handed it over to my subconscious, put that term in a bubble, that it just worked. Mm. If I tried to do it, it didn't. So, if, um, And it was exploring that. So with the sled dogs, that each emotion, each trigger, each thought will be a different dog. And each one coming up would be the one going, hey, look at me, look at me. Like you were saying earlier with that child in the supermarket is playing up having a tantrum. Even if the parents are arguing with the child, the child is still getting what it wants, even if, even if it's not in the way that he would or she would necessarily want it, it still gets the attention. Mm -hmm. So these emotions that come up when we it might be the right emotion, but at the wrong time and the deep underwater probably isn't the right time to be having a hissy fit going, oh, I'm scared. Or maybe you're having a conversation at work or with a partner and that trigger and you shout something or say something that I, I don't know, it shouldn't really come out is the non-judgmental awareness. So Tinger, that's it, that's interesting. That came, so that will give me the pause, which came from you saying, why? Mm -hmm. Just that momentary pause of that's interesting. And then non-judgmental awareness and acceptance. And so with all of these, all of these dogs coming up for the sled dog analogy, mm. be trying to, I don't know, maybe it's the right dog at the wrong, wrong time, time and space. Mm -hmm. um, and just to say, hey, I see you. I'm going to come back and approach you later, try and get to know you better later. So it might be with um, alcohol abuse or it could be anything of these. They say, halt, um, are you hungry, angry, lonely, tired? This came up last time with you. Um, but just to make that pause to get to know the dog. And once you've got all of these emotions, once you know the emotions, knowing your physical self or in this sense, knowing the emotional self, 
you can then almost go on autopilot. Mm -hmm. So you as a conscious or one as a, as a conscious mind will be the sled dog musher. All of the emotions will be the dogs all trying to say, hey, what about me? What about me? The sled dog musher, his job is to get the dogs onto the gang line and calmly working together for the same common purpose. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, I still can't understand there's a monkey sat on the sled. <laughs> Does that ramble make sense? The monkey's always there. Yeah, and it's funny that you say this. I don't know if Deepesh is still in the room, but um, in yoga, I remember in one of my yoga trainings, there was a very, very similar analogy, but it's the horse with the, with the carriage and the driver. And it's like, exactly as you say it, like what, how, how they all represent different parts of our consciousness and our emotional state and the way that we interact with them um uh it's, yeah it's exactly the same yeah and the, the monkey is always there give the monkey something to do give yeah it to do. whether it's focusing on the diaphragm or doing a rubik's cube a metaphorical rubik's cube give it something to do get it out of the way yeah. and let the dogs take the the team to where it needs to go or hand over hand over to the part of you which is infinitely wise um and trust no, and surrender yeah trust and surrender yeah you remember that from the course exactly. <laughs> trust and surrender I remember a lot from that course it changed yeah that year changed an awful lot oh good I'm glad to hear yeah really nice I uh, thank you for sharing that analogy it's very powerful and I'm glad that you were able to make make the transfer or the the connection between what we did in the water and then Working with the dogs is beautiful. I mean, it's all nature at the end of the day. You know, it, it doesn't, the rules don't change whether you're in the water or whether you're in the, uh, you know, in the forest or with, with animals. You know, the, the, the rules are universal. Absolutely. Nature. So we just get to see it through different, uh, different portals, different filters, whatever. I don't know what's you kill a fly and it turns into two. <laughs> I've never killed a fly that did that, thankfully. <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a, with this analogy, like like if you have a fly which is disturbing you in a room while you're meditating, you kill one and then it converts to two, then you kill two, it converts to three. It's the same yeah, thing with if, if, yeah, if you focus on it, it's gonna piss you off even more. Yeah, yeah. same thing with the thoughts. Yeah, yeah, like focus on one thought and it just start taking you to a taking you to a rabbit hole of yeah <laughs> yeah where where we put our attention is what we bring alive so um you know life is going to be good life is going to be challenging life is going to be awful sometimes but it's you know what we focus on in that time and you know do we take the victim mentality do we empower ourselves to actually just sometimes allow ourselves to be sad you know it's not always about being happy sometimes sadness and grief is exactly the right emotion and we also have a tendency in the West, maybe globally, to, you know, sadness is not good and I shouldn't be sad and I have to always be happy and on and smiling and positive. Mm -mm. So, you know, to allow the full range of emotional expression is part of the process, but also not to get caught up um, and uh, not because then the thoughts will recreate themselves around the low mood or the low energy everything is shit and I can't do anything and see this is proof that I'm I can't do things and then we create thoughts around it and to be aware of uh what we're creating where we where we put our attention yeah oh twinkle wants to come and say hello so I think we're nearly there unless anybody else wants to say anything oh here's twinkle tones <laughs> So if there's no other questions, we'll say bye-bye. Um, <clears throat> Capucine, you got final, yeah. final words? No, no I mean, um, no, I guess I'll say that we'll see. <laughs> we'll have a safe journey back to France tomorrow. Yes. Thank, Thank you for you. taking your last evening. I guess you're going to go out and have a little bit of a goodbye meal or something. Tonight. Yes. Yes, okay. this this is it. This that's a plan. Yeah. All right. Well, have a lovely, lovely time. Say hello to everybody for me. How are you? Yeah. And thank you everybody for being here. Thank you. So
got that big that big hug going on in the in the community so thank you all so much and i'll see you all soon next workshop is on the 31st of march i'll be doing it's more of a workshop preparation for pranayama so i hope to see some of you there lots of love thank you sarah thank you bye. everyone bye bye thank you